Well, good morning. It is good to be back with you, and some of you may not have met me, but I come here maybe once or twice a year, and uh, just love coming to this with uh, this church and being with you. Uh, meet with Jordan pretty regularly, about once a month. We try to get together for a cup of coffee or something, and just love how he talks about you and just the support you've given him. And this week, giving him that time to go and be with his family and support them during this important time was very loving. And so thank you for the love you show to Jordan and Claire. And you've got a great team with Jordan and Claire, with Hallie and the, the, the board, the worship team up here. I just uh, am so appreciative of all the, the work that you do here in North Collins. And it's just good, good to be able to worship with you today. I'm going to go a little different in the sermon because Jordan was saying that you've been going through the, the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1 when it tells all the, the begats of you know, Jesus' heritage. And after that, though, Matthew tells the story of the birth of Jesus. And then it goes to chapter 2, and he has this, this interesting story about these three wise men that come from afar, and it tells the whole story of that. And sometimes we get this a little off in our nativities. Uh, they were not kings. Some of our carols say, we three kings come. Uh, they were what we call the king's magi, which was an advisor to a king. And probably from Babylon or Persia, somewhere one of the eastern countries. And so they would have probably come representing the kings of the east. And, and, but they were known in part for giving advice to kings and in transition to helping to coronate or to install new kings. And so the importance of them coming to Israel and acknowledging the king of the Jews here to this baby born in, in a stall to this unlikely mother was just ironic. It was just mind-blowing. And as you hear this story that, the, of how they came, I, met, I wonder how Jesus first heard this story. When he got older, how Mary would tell them about it. And in chapter 2, verse 11, it says, On, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now one of the things when the, the word that's used here for treasure is actually like a treasure chest or treasure box. You know, in the days before banks or safety deposit boxes or IRAs or anything like that, this is how people kept their most valuable resources. They're, they're things that, they, that made them wealthy. They would store in a box. And so these, probably coming with the king's treasure from the east, they came and they presented this gold and frankincense and myrrh, the, the, which were very rare and expensive spices and um, the gold, of course. And as I read the story, I sometimes wonder, what did Mary do with that? And, and it's Jesus, I wonder when she told Jesus about when you were born, these three magi came, if she wouldn't go out and open her little box and show him some of the gold and show him this frankincense and tell, tell them the story. And what would that do for Jesus? How would that impact him as he is growing up to realize who God had created him to be? who God had established him. And that was, that was the king of the Jews, the king of kings, in a sense. As Jesus began his public ministry, he, he taught about the kingdom. He used this word to describe the new life that, was, that he was ushering in, this new kingdom that he was ushering in. And the people that he was preaching to understood this. They, they actually had, had prayed. I mean, the Jews would, peer out, would daily pray for the kingdom to be restored. And in their mind, the kingdom was going back to the glory days of David and Solomon when, the, when the Israel was like one of the most prominent kingdoms in the world and people were coming from all afar to, to get wisdom from Solomon to see the, the great houses and temples that, that had been built. 
And they said, oh, we long for that day when we'll be a country with, you know, strong military, with big buildings and with all the, the elite prestige that they had before. And then Jesus would say, no, my kingdom is different. My kingdom's not going to overthrow the Romans. It's going to change lives. And I imagine a few people that would hear this would just get this discouraged look and walk away. Say, I thought you were going to bring a revolution. And then Jesus would say to them, no, if you could only see the kingdom, it is far better than anything you can imagine. If you could get a picture of what this kingdom will do, it is better. It is more costly. It is is worth it all. And I want to study three short verses in Matthew 13 that tell a parable. It's just a quick story. Two, Two quick stories, really. And they're describing the kingdom in its incredible value. It's worth more than you can imagine. But also how even even though it costs you so much, it's worth that and even more. I was trying to think, what would I use if I were to tell that story today? Or what would would be something that would be extremely, I'd love to have it, but it's more than I could afford, but maybe just in that reach, but it's a bargain if I could get it. There's a, a news I read back in the 80s. American Airlines was, was really short on cash, and they needed some gimmick to, to bring in cash. And they decided that they would sell a card. And if you bought this card, the Air Pass, American Air Pass, Pass if you bought that card, you could fly first class anywhere you wanted as often as you wanted for the rest of your life, which is a pretty good deal. Would you want one? Yeah, I would want one. All right, so first class, as often as you want for the rest of your life. How much do you think that they sold that card for? Any guesses? 10,000 is more. How much? (laughs) Closest without going over. $250,000 which is much more than I can afford, probably more than most of you can afford. But you got to admit, if you can afford that, that would be a sweet card to have. You know, you just have this card that you could fly first class anywhere you wanted for the rest of your life as often as you want. They, they had a, a companion pass, a second card to go with it for only 150000 You get a second card, and so for four hundred, you and your best friend can go wherever you want, anywhere. Now, as American Airlines sold this, they sold about 100 of these. And mainly wealthy people that you know, had more money than they knew what to do with, but they traveled a lot. Uh, Willie Mays, one of the baseball players, was one of the 100 that bought it. Uh, Mark Cuban, who's still alive, is, is one of the people who bought the, the card. And there's, like I said, about 100 people bought these. And after about a year, American Airlines was studying, how are we doing with this? And they were surprised at how often people were using their cards. And it's like, I didn't get understand that. <laughs> One guy had traveled to Japan and Sydney, Australia. He had racked up a million dollars worth of flights in one year. Wow. He, just, he, just, he just flew full time or something. And uh, so American Airlines said, no, this is, this is too good of a deal. And they wrote all 100 people and said, we want to buy your card back. We we, we, we realized we made a mistake. We'll give you your $400,000 back, but we need your card back. No one sold it back. They, they, they all kept the card. They said, we like what we got here. And uh, they went to court. And they tried to say, we, we're going to go out of business if we keep doing that. The court said, no, you made this offer in good faith. You have to honor it. And from, from what I read, if you have that card, you still can fly first class as often as you want. And until you die. And so, it's a pretty sweet deal. Jesus was saying, there's something that when you find it, you realize this is incredibly valuable. This is more valuable than almost anything you can imagine. And it's available to you. 
The parable is found in Matthew chapter 13. I'd like to read verses 44 through 46. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and he bought it. Let's pray. Father, as we look at these two parables, I pray that this morning your Holy Spirit would come and help me to preach and say what you want me to say so that we could get the meaning out of these two stories. And I also pray for your Holy Spirit to guide each one here in this room and even those watching online, that they would be able to perceive the value of your kingdom. That they would understand what you are trying to say to us today. And then that we would be obedient to the truth that your Holy Spirit reveals. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The common theme between these two stories is that they sold everything they had. It's it's what ties the two together. Now the first, imagine how they were feeling about that. The first was a farmer, and all it says was he's out in a field and he stumbled upon this treasure. Now, The word treasure, that's the same word, actually one of the few places in the Bible this word is used, as the the story of the Magi, that they they brought from their treasure box gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And Jesus uses that same word, that in in the field he, he stumbled upon or he dug up this treasure box. And I can just imagine him going down, what is this? And he, he opens it up and his eyes just get huge as he sees the gold, he sees the silver, he sees whatever jewels are in there. It was, it was where people stored their life savings. And a wealthy person had probably stored it there and then went off to battle and died at war or something happened and no one knew where this was buried. And generations, maybe even centuries later, this man was out in someone else's field. So I'm imagining he was probably hired to plow it. I'm not, it's a sort of a little imagination there. And he stumbled upon it. The owner did not know it was there. or no way he would have sold the field. And this man looked at it. Immediately knew the only way I can have this is if I buy the field. And he did this calculation in his mind in a split second. What would it take to buy the field? And it would take for him everything he had. He probably wasn't a very wealthy man then. All he he had was just enough to buy this field, but he calculated what he had, and he went back and he sold everything. I mean, he just went, will you buy this? Will you buy this? And just sort of this fire sale. What do we got to do? And he sold everything he had. He came out with just the money that he had from the sale, and he bought that field. But did you catch the word, in his joy, he went and sold everything he had? If you're hearing this and you're saying, well, that would be hard for me to sell everything I have. No, it, when he wrote in his journal that day, that was the, the least important thing of the day was selling everything. It's like, but I got this treasure box. And he could just imagine all that was in there. The merchant of fine pearls. I imagine probably more middle class. He, had, he probably had a nice home. I imagine having a wife and kids and you know, maybe a cart and a horse or whatever, because he traveled around, he bought pearls. He had an inventory of other pearls and precious stones. A little bit of imagination there. But then he came upon this one pearl that for whatever reason was rare and extremely valuable. And he did the calculation in his mind. What would it take to get this? He saw the, the price, said, I will have to sell everything I have in order to get this pearl. And he realized 
even if I did that, this pearl is so much more valuable that he didn't think twice. It, it is interesting. In the second story, it doesn't say in his joy he went and sold everything he had. I, I wonder if, if maybe the more you have, the harder it is to get rid of it. A little bit. But neither did he hesitate. He knew that this pearl was worth it. And he sold everything in order to get it. Now, as we start to think about application here, it may be that you're thinking, well, this is another sermon about giving. It's another sermon about, I've got, what do I give? No, this, this is not about giving. God does not need your house or your car, or whatever it may be hard for you to let go of, but does God still ask you to let go of it? At least to hold it with open hands and say, God, everything I have is yours. I think he does. But it's not somehow buying salvation or buying God's favor in any way. There's a story in the book of Acts where Peter and some of the other apostles were, were going from town to town, and they were, they were doing incredible miracles. They were healing the sick. They were casting out demons. They were doing some of the things that God had enabled them to do. And this one guy came up, and he said, this is great. I, I've sort of been a magician on the side, too. I would love to be able to do what you're doing. How much will it cost me? to buy the Holy Spirit. And Peter looked at him in Acts 8.20, he said, may your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. But this is not something that I'm saying you've got to go and sell enough or you've got to give enough so that you earn God's kingdom. This is about the condition of your heart and where's your treasure is, your heart will be also. And so God doesn't need anything from you, but he loves you, and he wants to give you a life that is so much better than the life you are living. But in order to receive the life that he has for you, in order for you to receive his life, his kingdom, if we'll use that word again, you have to be willing to let go of your old kingdom, the things that you have been serving, the things you have been striving for. But if you're unable to see the kingdom of Jesus, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, then you will, you will not be willing, it, it will not add up to you to let go of everything in this life but only when God gives you that glimpse of his kingdom. There's another occasion when a man came up to Jesus, and he was, sometimes we describe him as a rich, rich ruler, a rich, rich uh, young man. And he came to Jesus, he said, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? So how do I get this life that you're offering, this new, new way of living? And Jesus said, well, obey the commandments. And he said, I've been a good Jew. And he said, I've I've pretty much obeyed the commandments since I was a kid. And then Jesus looked at him, and uh, this is Mark 10, verse 21. Jesus looked at him, and he loved him. And he said, one thing you lack. Go, sell everything you have. And give it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then, Come follow me. The invitation is to come with Jesus, to enter this new life. But it does require letting go of your old life. It does require, require loving Jesus, loving God more than you love anything else. While it doesn't always mean you got to sell your house or sell your car, it means if God asks you to, and you're pretty sure it's God saying that to you, you got to be willing to do it. Do whatever he asks. And trust that he's got your best interest at heart. When Jesus would say, follow me, he wasn't just putting his arm around a guy and saying, come on, let's take a walk for a couple hours. Let's spend the afternoon talking about it and then then you'll go and live in the life the way you want to live it. Follow me means 
drop your old way of life, and come be a disciple of mine. That was an invitation that a rabbi would often give to invite people to become disciples, to become students of that rabbi. Sometimes for two, three, four, five years until they could maybe become a rabbi of their own and have their own school of disciples. But it meant dropping your old way of life. So when Jesus came up to Peter and said, follow me, it meant Leave your fishing boats and your nets and your gear all behind and come be a disciple of mine for the next three years. When Jesus said to Matthew, who's a tax collector, come follow me, he meant leave your tax collecting booth and the wealth that you had acquired in that and come follow me and be a disciple of mine. When Jesus says to us, and I think, I think that's often the way he invites us to be a Christian. I mean, we, we use different terms when you talk about being a Christian. You, I got saved, I'm born again, or I'm, you know, um, whatever, and accepted Jesus in my heart. We use different ways. I think Jesus most often just said, follow me. Become a disciple of mine. Live the life that I'm calling you to live. It meant leave everything behind and, and follow Jesus with everything you have. But it requires that, that surrender. And even on a daily basis, maybe you've been a Christian for many years, but it's a daily surrender. The life that God is calling you to live will compete with the life that you want to live. I want to do well in my job. I want to get money. I want to get fame or whatever we want. We want to be liked. We want, to, we want things that aren't necessarily what God wants for us. And God says, you got to trust that my way is worth more than the way that you're living without me. C.S. Lewis wrote a, a book called Mere Christianity. I highly recommend that book, just a summary. Christianity is probably 100 years old now, but it's a great book. And here's a, an extended quote from the book that summarizes what I'm saying. It says, The principle runs through all life from top to bottom. Give up yourself, and you will find your real self. Lose your life, and you will save it. Submit to death, death of your ambitions and favorite wishes every day, and death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being, and you will find eternal life. Keep back nothing. Nothing that you have not given, not, nothing that you have not given away will really be yours. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself, and you will find in the long run. Only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ, and you will find him. And with him, everything else thrown in. Jesus' invitation to follow him is an invitation to receive his kingdom. To let him be the king of your life. To be the one whose authority you follow. But it's not like other kingdoms. Or we, we actually probably wouldn't use the word kingdoms. We'd say other governments. Other authorities. We may put our hope in human authority. And we say, you know, we need a better government. We need better Congress, a better president. And we We can get all worked up about, well, the governor needs to do this or be this way or the Congress needs to do this or Supreme Court or whatever. And I would suggest to you, imagine your ideal government. And that's, realize it's going to be different for everyone in this room, you know, what that's going to look like. But just imagine they were all born-again Christians who were committed to following Jesus Christ. President, vice president, senators, congressmen, governors, all the way down to the local 
dog catcher, whatever. You know, and, and they were all followers of Jesus. That wouldn't solve our problems. Uh, it may be better than our current government. I, I suspect it would be. But that will not solve our problems. And if that's your hope, then Jesus' kingdom is going to compete with that hope. But Jesus' kingdom is not a human government. It is a spiritual government. Because if we had all the best Christian leaders, or whatever leaders that thought, felt and thought the way you thought, there would still be people that rebelled and wanted to commit crimes. There'd still be people that were jealous of each other and would undermine and backbite and you know, argue, and there would still be a divided country because we don't all agree about what's best. But Jesus' kingdom can deal with the problem of sin in the human heart. And until we deal with that problem, no external government's going to fix things. And so when Jesus was talking about his kingdom and how in order to be a part of his kingdom, you had to let him rule in your life, he was saying there are things that I will do in your life that will change you to make you to be a valuable part of that kingdom. And if we could see what God will do when, when people submit to the authority of Jesus to change the selfishness in the human heart, to change that rebellion against God, when we stop striving for the things that we want and submit to the things that God wants, then life starts to change. And if we could have that glimpse of this, this kingdom, if we could open that box of that treasure and see what God could do if we would submit to him as our king, it would be worth so much more than anything we have. Then, and only if we could see it, would we be willing to go and sell everything we have and buy that field and live that life and daily surrender to Jesus Christ. That is the call. When Jesus whispers in your ear, come, follow me. It is that call to live the life, the adventure that he has for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is a daily struggle. But this morning, I pray that we would get a glimpse of your kingdom. Jesus, the reason why we celebrate your birth more than 2,000 years after you came is because you offer hope to a world that is broken and messed up in ways that we can't even imagine how to fix it. But you offer this new path, this life that goes against the grain of everything this world is doing, and you deal with the problem of sin. I pray that we would come to you, follow you, and allow you to work in our heart that sanctifying work of grace and make us the men and women that you've called us to be. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.